Okay, so welcome everyone to Math for Data Science Beginners. Um, thank you so much for joining. Uh, I assume you're all here because you're interested in data science and want to kind of get your feet wet in the math portion of it. Um, it, it seems that I've seen over the over the two years that I've been here that uh, math is a little bit of a, a touchy subject for folks. So we want to demystify it and make it um, really more uh, attainable. We want to make you guys feel comfortable with it because, you know, uh, math is a an enormous part of data science. Uh, my name is Jelani. I am the marketing uh, program manager for data science. So I handle pretty much everything, uh, everything marketing having to do with data science. So um, another fun fact is that I actually am a student as well. So I recently joined our uh, data science self-paced course. So I'm also a student, so I can speak to a little bit of the student experience as well. Uh, so just a fun fact for you guys to know as we as we kind of go through this. Um, just a, a couple things before we get started. Once again, in the chat, for us to all see your, your message, um, go ahead and click that panelists button inside the chat, drop down to panelists and attendees so we can all feel sort of connected and, and, um, and we're all kind of in the same room, but we're, we're kind of not. So want to make sure that we kind of, um, you know, create as much of a communal feel as possible. Um, and if you have questions, feel free to throw them in the chat. I'm going to try to get, the, get we're gonna, we're gonna kind of stop in between um, particular sections and, and take questions. So, um, and I apologize in advance if we don't get to every single question, um, if there are a lot of them, I do wanna be mindful of everyone's time. So, um, but feel free to, you know, reach out after if you really have some pressing questions. Um, with that being said, I will turn it over to your instructor for today, Jeff Herman, who is also my instructor. So <laughs> fun fact there. Jeff, take it away. Awesome, thanks Jelani. Um, I'm gonna start with sharing my screen. Um, and let me just make sure I got everything set up. By, by the way, there's a quick question from Isaac here. He says, are you going to get into any uh, SQL here? Um, no, no uh, SQL today. Um, for, for this uh, kind of kind of lecture or, um, um, yeah, we'll call it a lecture. Um, for this lecture, just going to be kind of focusing on, on just some kind of basic math. Um, if you're like interested in like some like SQL practice, I can definitely recommend some sources a little bit later. Um, and then I saw another question from Darius. And Darius says, isn't stats the most important field of math and data science? And I don't know, that's a, that is a good question. I think um, stats are definitely important in, in the data science world. Uh, but math's also like kind of pure mathematics is also super important. Most uh, algorithms um, they're op the optim optimizer behind the algorithm is using some sort of calculus, some sort of gradient descent. So um, I, th I think they're both like, I think pure mathematics and statistics are both super important. You can't really do data science without uh, both of them. Um, cool. Well, let's, let's get started. So like, like I was saying, this is mathematics and data science. My name is Jeff Herman, like Jelani said. Um, I am a data science instructor here. Um, I'm based in Kansas City, Missouri. Um, anyone from, I didn't think I saw anyone from Kansas City on here, but if anyone is, you should definitely uh, post it in the chat or around there. Um, I didn't see any Missouri. I didn't see any Kansas or Missouri. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, Texas, the, okay. You might um, be the rapper. <laughs> <laughs> Louisville, um, cool. Well. Um, like, like I said, based in Kansas City, I've been teaching here at Flatiron for two and a half years. Um, prior to that, I was a data scientist at a railroad. Um, and I mainly did research on fuel consumption, um, which is kind of boring. Uh, but a project that like, I'm pretty proud of that I think is kind of interesting is uh, locomotives. They have inward facing cameras. And that's because the crews will sleep on them. They'll play on their phones. They'll do a bunch of weird stuff that they're not supposed to. And what they'll do is they'll take Vaseline and they'll put it on the camera lens and just wipe it there. 
And I wrote an algorithm that determines whether there's Vaseline or not on a camera lens. So kind of kind of a weird application of data science. And um, I consider myself an expert at that. So if you ever have like an have a photo and you're not sure if there's like Vaseline or not on the camera, like reach out to me. I'll be able to like I'll be able to give you my professional opinion. Um, but yeah, I think I think it's just kind of interesting because there's just so many different applications of data science. And then um, prior to that, I worked at a different railroad. I was a manager of a locomotive repair facility, and I got kind of a picture of that from uh, way back when when I used to have to like I used to call this my costume. Um, so, but uh, my Halloween costume. But um, I really I really do believe that anyone can transition into data analytics. Um, like I, I've had students that are chefs, I've had students that are social workers, nurses, all kinds of different backgrounds. And um, so I, I, I was obviously not doing anything like hugely computer related and um, was able to transition. So a um, little bit about Flatiron School. Um, goal is, our mission is to enable, enable the pursuit of a better life through education. We have, um, bunch of different programs. I have experience with the data science one, obviously. Um, so cool. So let's jump into data science. And so what is data science? Um, a, a common thing I hear about like, what is data science? Uh, a data scientist, I should say, is a person that knows more math than a traditional computer programmer. And then someone that knows more um, computer science than maybe like a mathematician or a statistician. And then it's also important to have that domain uh, in your business knowledge. And um, that's kind of one, one way I was, that kind of made that transition into data science easier for me is I had experience with locomotives. I had worked at a, at a railroad, you know, um, kind of validating that locomotives were paired correctly. And I was able to use that knowledge to work as a, a data scientist at another company. Um, so. I don't think you, you really can't be a data scientist if you don't have this math part. If you if you um, if you just if you're really comfortable with programming and um, you have some like domain knowledge and um, like railroading for this example, like you could you could be like a software engineer if you. But um, it really is important to have some some good math and statistics. Um, I think I saw like a QA pop up. How long did it take me? Um, so like transitioning from a manager of a locomotive repair facility to a data scientist? Um, that's a good question. It was a while ago. Um, so I was kind of doing it kind of passively, kind of part time. Um, but it probably took me about 18 months of like learning Python. But again, I was not putting, I was, it was really passive. Like if I would have been a lot more focused, it would have been a lot easier and a lot faster. Um, but, um, so we're gonna be going over some math concepts. So kind of the basis of math that you'll use in data science is it's used to generalize stuff. Like if you get a bunch of information about um, like weights of, I'm a big fan of the NBA. So if you get a bunch of like, uh, heights of NBA players. What's the average height of the player? What's the average height of a player by position? Um, so generalizing stuff, standardizing stuff, um, being able to like look at two different data sets and being able to make a decision. Are they similar? Are they not similar? Can, can we actually compare them? Um, normalizing data. Um, well, so a lot of these machine learning algorithms have assumptions with them. Um, and um, if, they, if, you don't, if you don't meet those assumptions, sometimes you'll have to make some changes to that data. A lot of times you can perform like a log transformation on a data if it's not normal. Um, and then predictive modeling, that's kind of what most people think of when they think of data science, they think of making predictions. Um, so um, there's a lot of math, a lot of statistics behind that. Um, so topics we're gonna be covering today, um, we're gonna be going over how to center data, uh, scaling data, we're going to be doing a z-score transformation. Um, we're going to use a machine learning classifier called k-nearest neighbor. And um, finally, showing, um, showing a regression problem. Cool. 
Uh, any, any questions or anything so far before I kind of jump into the math? Don't be shy, folks. We're all here to learn together. And if, if some of this doesn't make sense to you now, it will. Hopefully by the end of this uh, workshop, it will. That's the point, right? So would you recommend full-time study time? Um, you know, it kind of depends on your situation. If you, if you can, um, if you have the ability to like work to, to learn something full-time, um, then, then I would, then I would do it for sure. Um, so let's, let's jump in a little bit in Python. That's what we teach here at, um, uh, Flatiron School. And, um, it, it's something that I'm really, really passionate about. I love Python and, um, it's something that even, even in my spare time, I'm like coding in Python because I have so much fun doing it, but, um, it's a, it's a really popular language. It has a huge community. Um, this graph is a little bit outdated because it's 2018. Um, but uh, Python is still the far and away the industry leader in uh, machine in the data science world. So JavaScript and Java, they're not really um, languages that are used in data science. Um, but huge community, super popular. It's probably the easiest language to um, probably the easiest language to learn, in my opinion. Um, but Here's some more pros and cons of it. Um, but huge community, easy to use. Um, it's really flexible. Like people use it in software engineering. You can use it for data science. Um, knowing Python just opens up a lot of doors. Um, it's easy to pick up. It's really similar to English. Um, and then um, also some of the, like the um, the deep learning libraries like TensorFlow and PyTorch. Uh, these are two libraries that are used for neural networks. Um, and um, they're, they're really kind of state of the art. Like when a new paper comes out on a new like concept for like self-driving cars, it, it's um, because these languages are created by these huge tech companies, they're usually implemented really quickly. Um, then the cons, it's a little bit slower than other languages. Um, so cool. Um, well, cool. So now I'm going to start jumping into things. Um, so first thing right here is going to be doing some import statements. These are going to just allow me while I'm while I'm kind of going through this. Um, it's going to this is going to allow me to make visualizations, and this is for loading in a data set, and uh, this is for some kind of basic statistics. Um, Yeah, and what I mean by slower language um, is um, um, not not uh, not as in like not as in like uh, slower to pick up or like faster to pick up. Um, it just if you were gonna like if you were trying to predict like stock prices and you wanted to make a make a decision on like a stock price and whether to buy or sell it, buy buy or sell a stock price, and you needed it to work in milliseconds python might not be the best choice for it you probably would want to use um like c sharp or something um but for um then i think that's really kind of the one downside when you need to make these kind of real-time decisions yeah slower runtime um just just real quick um we're getting a couple of questions about like the the, the jupiter notebook like if we're going to get the if you guys are going to get the link to it we'll share out this um notebook with you after so you guys can kind of go through it after but for the sake of time it was just easier for you guys to just um kind of watch now and then um kind of get a, a basic idea and then we'll we'll share the notebook with you along with the recording uh, after and just for some of you just in the chat just don't forget to hit that panelist drop down button to panelists and attendees uh just so we we see each other's uh questions cool thanks guys Ooh, thanks Jolini. um so then, and I also, so these were just to make some import statement, were some import statements. Then I have a bunch of helper functions here. Um, you know, the, kind of the scope of this lecture is gonna be kind of focusing on math. So I'm not gonna be diving too deep into this uh, code, but I will be explaining it as we're using these functions, what, what is going on. Um, and again, these this notebook is gonna be shared. So um, I'm gonna be playing around with this data set and this data set is on cars. Um, so, 
loading it in, um, loaded it in, in as a pandas data frame. Um, and I'm gonna do some really basic manipulation on this. Um, and so what's, what's I'm doing is I'm just taking price. You'll, you may have noticed that there are some question marks in this data set. I wanted to remove those and I filled them in with the mean. Um, so now I want to take a look at my data set. So this dot describe, it gives you the, the descriptive statistics about your uh, data set. Um, so if we look at price, we see that we have a mean of 13,000. Um, we see we have a median of 10,000. Um, anytime you see that the mean is greater than the median, that usually means you have some outliers or you have more points, you have some points on the high side. Um, and we can kind of see that we have um, the 75th uh, quartile is at $16,000. And then the maximum value in this data set is $45,000. Um, yep, yeah, mean, median, mode. Um, so they don't, uh, this dot describe, if this was categorical data, it would show a mode. But since price is continuous, it's, there won't be a mode. Um, so now let's, um, I've classified three features as continuous. This was just my decision um, on cars. So we have length, we have width, we have height. And I wanna plot these out. And we see that because they're on different scales, it's a little bit hard to compare compare them to see if they have a similar distribution. Like length, it's in the magnitude of 125 to 225. Uh, width is you know uh, less than 75. Both of these are less than 75. Um, so one thing I can do is I can do what's called mean centering. And what this will do is we'll make it a little bit easier to compare these different distributions. Um, so what, the, what it does is it takes each data point and it subtracts it from the mean. And what that'll do is it'll uh, make the mean of all three of these distributions at zero. Um, so an example of this, um, I'm just created a quick data set here, two, four, 10, 12. Um, and the mean of this data set is 12. So what it does is if I mean center everything, which is right here, it takes everything and subtracts 12 from it. So this first data point, two minus 12, it becomes negative 10. And four minus 12 becomes negative eight. And what you see here is that the data points, um, the actual distribution, um, nothing really changes. Um, this point is still the same distance from this point. These points, we still have three points to the left of the, uh, uh, the mean. We still have the same number of points to the right of the mean. Um, so the overall distribution doesn't change. But what is helpful about this is that it's easier to compare our data. So now if, we, if I apply this mean centering to those three columns, here's what this data set looks like now. So um, it, it moved everything over to the, and uh, centered it over zero. Um, so it's a little bit easier to compare now, but it's, it's, it's still not perfect because this length, if we remember, let me scroll back up. Um, the, um, the spread of the data was much larger and that's because this magnitude is much larger. So while we've, uh, shifted our data and um, everything has the same mean, it's still hard to compare because of the variance was much different, was on different scales. And um, that's kind of where I'm going to go next is uh, perform what's called a z-score uh, standardization. And what that does is also take each value, I'll subtract the mean, and then divide by the standard deviation. That, that gives you what's called a z-score. Um, and let me run this. So this is that z-score standardization. And we see that, again, um, so it takes the data that originally had a mean of 12. Now the mean is now 0. The standard deviation was 6.7. Now it is 1. And we, but we see that the overall uh, distribution, the data points, uh, it still maintains the, the relationship it had. Um, 
So if I apply to this, this to my data set now, now we see that the data is actually really similar uh, when you get when you move everything on the same scale. And this could just be a way to like compare distributions. It could be a way to um, a lot of algorithms want uh, uh, things in the same scale. Um, and I see I have a question for different Darius. Wouldn't it be better to analyze between variables at a time or like a box plot? Um, so it kind of depends on what you're wanting to do. Like a box plot, you know, gives gives you a lot of information. I think a, a density plot also like gives you a lot of information as well. Um, so like a, a box plot. Um, um, so a box plot will tell you like will give you like information like what where's the median, where's the, the IQR range. Um, I like density plots a little bit better with continuous variables because I can really I know exactly what the distribution is like the box plot just gives you some like descriptive statistics about the distribution. So why would we want to subtract the mean? Um, because we want to we want to be able to compare these three distributions and see if if there's anything like anything that's jumping out does one of them have more data on the high side or versus the low side and if everything's not on the same scale we can't compare them um, so um it, uh, despite being on different scales the distribution of length width and height seem to be very close uh, when measuring in terms of standard deviation, um, when when measure when measuring in terms of standard deviation distance from the mean, um, so this was called applying a z-score. Um, a lot of times you'll see this, like an example, like if if you got a like a score of a 32 on the ACT, and then um, and you knew what the average ACT score was and the standard deviation of ACT scores are, you could get a um, Z score from it. And then you can do the, and then let's say you got, um, I never took the SAT, but whatever is the scale the SAT is on, and you got an S SAT score of 1200, and you knew the mean, standard mean and standard deviation for SAT, you could say, which one did you do better on by looking at the percentiles. So even though the ACT is on a, I think a 36 scale um, and um, the SAT is on a completely different scale. You could use that Z score to say, okay, which one did I do better on? Yeah, <laughs> there seems like there's a bunch of different scales for the SAT. Um, so when should you not Z score? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, so, um, with a lot of machine learning algorithms, um, so I'm about to show a machine learning algorithm, uh, K nearest neighbor, that uh, it's it's required to do it. But there's also a lot of machine learning algorithms where you want want it in the base data, in the base data. So like, um, there's a machine learning algorithm I'm going to be talking about here in a little bit uh, called linear regression, and I'm not going to do a Z score on that. And the reason I'm not going to do that is uh, linear regression. Um, let's take a little bit of a detour. There's this visualization I really like. Um, yeah, so these are all different machine learning algorithms. And um, you see where linear regression, so I'm going to be talking a little bit about k nearest neighbor next. I'm also going to be talking about linear regression. We see where linear regression is on this. And we see that it's um, not a very accurate model in, compared, in comparison to all these other algorithms, but it's super interpretable. Um, so I'm, I would I'm going to leave linear regression in its uh, base variable because I want to understand. You typically use linear regression to under for like inference to understand how this relationship impacts um, another variable. So and um, so like a, if you're trying to predict if you make a linear regression to predict the price of a house, you could use like bedrooms and bathrooms and. Um, so if the coefficient for bedrooms is ten thousand dollars, that means that if you go from um, that if you have two bedrooms and you go from two bedrooms to three bedroom 
through three bedrooms, the price on average would increase by $10,000. Um, so, so it just kind of depends on what you're wanting to do. Um, I saw someone wanted to see this URL, so. Um, cool. Um, so now we're gonna take a look at our first machine learning algorithm. Um, and um, so what, what I'm gonna be doing here is using k-nearest neighbor. And what k-nearest neighbor works is, um, 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 sorry, this thing, I forgot this thing was running already. Um, so, so how this works is if we have a point, this black point right here, and we wanna predict whether it's a green point or we wanna predict whether it's a red point, um, you first select a value for K and that is how many data points you wanna look at. So in this case, we selected five. Um, and um, you, you take a look at the five points that have the nearest distance to this black point. And because in this case, there, when you looked at these five uh, points that are closest, three of them were green and two of them were red. So it, it's essentially like a vote, does a vote. And three of them voted green, two of them voted red. So three is greater than two. So it predicted it, predicted it to be green. Um, so it finds those five nearest neighbors, three of them are green, two of them are red. So its prediction would be green. So um, in this case, let's say we have a data point that's right here, it is orange. And let's say we selected K to be three. So we would look at the three nearest neighbors. And if two of them were blue, this bluish color, then it would be blue. If two of them were uh, this greenish color, then our prediction would be green. Out of um, curiosity, do you think that this would be, if we were predicting this data point, do you think it would be blue or do you think it would be green? Any guesses, green, blue? Yeah, I think it's. <laughs> I think it's pretty close. Like, um, like if you if if you were to like draw out these lines and measure them, like uh, I think definitely these are the two closest points. But whatever the third closest point is, either this point or this point, and you know, just eyeballing it, it's hard to say. Um, so, um, it's it's kind of a tough one. Uh, this is like right in the middle. Um, but let's let's show like an example of this. Um, so I'm going to create um, some data points, and I want to show. So last time, so remember the z-score transformation. Of these, I have three data points right here: A, B, and C. Which point is closest to A? Do you think point B is closest to A, or do you think point C is closest to A? And point B is yeah yeah that's a good 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 call. Uh, I did intentionally make this as kind of a trick question because I wanted to show like the z-score transformation. Um, But let's see, I saw some Bs, now I saw some Cs. Um, yeah, we are gonna be using Euclidean distance. Um, so, all right, so let's, let's talk about it. Um, so if I was gonna calculate the distance between A and B, I'm gonna use uh, Pythagorean theorem, which is just A squared plus B squared equals C squared. So that's the distance between, if you went a straight line up, straight line over, it'd be this hypotenuse, this diagonal distance would be this. Um, so the distance between A and B, um, just to verify, is 20.02. 
um, the distance between A and C is 17. So uh, this distance is actually shorter than this distance right here. And uh, I saw a bunch of people, I saw a few people mention this, and it's, it is because of the scale, because the distance between here and here is, um, what is it, 15 and 22, so 17. And the distance between here and here is 20. So um, it's just because the scale is um, is uh, off. So that's why we'll, it's important to do this z-score transformation to make sure that all of these are uh, on the same unit. So um, if I was to do that z-score transformation, um, yeah, yeah, it is it is definitely misleading and. Um, um, and a lot of times when you're working on this, you're going to be working with data sets that are on much different scales. So like, um, like, like, let's say you're doing this K nearest neighbor, but for like houses, if you have a feature, like imagine like this is square footage. So the square footage of the house that's in the unit of thousands, then maybe this is like, I don't know the unit of bedrooms, but this is really large houses. Um, but so you, you a lot of times be working with things that are on a lot different scales. Don't you have to subtract because data? Um, I'm not sure what you're asking there. Um, um, yeah, but, but we, we make it a right triangle. So if you go straight up and straight over, that's a 90 degree angle right there. Um, so straight up, straight over, right, will be a 90 degree angle. Um, so then if I was to apply the um, z-score uh, transformation to my two data sets, here's those arrays after I've um, transformed them. And then here's what, here's what my data set looks like now. Um, so we have uh, A and Z and A and B, and we see that, you know, just eyeballing it, um, um, just, just eyeballing it, it's a little hard to say, like, what is, what point is closer. Um, so again, like if I were to apply, uh, this is called uh, Euclidean distance, um, the distance between A and B is 2.13. And the distance between A and C is uh, 2.18. So um, yeah, these points are super, super, super close to each other. So um, that's that's an example of why you want to do a z-score transformation. Um, so cool. Um, so now, Jeff, can I stop you for one second? Yeah, 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 yeah. Go ahead. Sorry. Um, just real quick, guys, uh, two things. One, uh, don't forget to hit that drop down button in the chat um, and drop down the, the blue button, sorry, the blue panelist button, drop down to panelists and attendees on that just so we can all see each other's um, conversation. And because you may be answering a question that someone else thought of but just didn't write. Um, and number two, I wanted to launch this quick little mid event poll. Um, sorry to, to drop this in on you guys kind of um, abruptly, but it'd be really helpful, really trying to do a better job of like getting feedback from folks and seeing like um, kind of like who's in the room and, you know, it's really helpful for us to, it, it helps with the, the programming. So just going to launch this quick little poll. Um, it's only four questions, multiple choice, um, super easy. Uh, so I'll just give you guys like two minutes. Oh. Boy, something going on outside. Um, yeah, just, uh, yeah, if you could just take a couple of uh, two minutes and uh, do that, that'd be great. Um, really appreciate it. And uh, give Jeff, give Jeff a two minute, uh, two minute break. All right. Yeah, there you go. Don't say I ever did nothing for you. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> oh, man. While we wait, um, I'll give it, yeah, I'll give it about two minutes. 
Um, we're all stuck in the house for the most part. Um, any, any, uh, any, any good movie TV recommendations? Anybody see anything good that they, they think? And it can be data science related too. I saw a couple that um, there's a YouTube originals movie. I'm um, not movie. It's a, I guess it's a documentary with like um, uh, Robert Downey Jr. And he's talking about like, uh, I think it's artificial intelligence. It's about artificial intelligence. It's really good. Oh, Tenet is a masterpiece. Oh my God. I've been, that movie has been on my list to watch for the longest and I have not gotten it. AlphaGo was really good too. Did you see yeah, AlphaGo was good? good? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, yeah, that's blows my mind. Yeah, if you're into data science and like machine learning and stuff like that, definitely um, watch AlphaGo. It's on, the whole thing is on YouTube. You guys should definitely check it out. Wild, wild country. I remember I watched that. But that looks like the, the bog one, right? What is it? Um, I, don't know, I don't even know how to explain it. Um, you probably probably have to Google it. Just this like cult that moved to Oregon and just the mayhem that happened. Wow. <laughs> Isn't the vision from Avengers a living AI like a modern po- Pinocchio? <laughs> uh, and probably true. Um, cool uh coming to america too the expanse i meant to watch that too the expanse i meant to watch that uh cool i'll give it one more minute um see it see stuff um see some uh stuff trickling in so just let uh let folks go i i'll tell you uh i saw it here uh ted lasso i've been seeing the commercials and i have not i have not watched it yet Behind her eyes. Which one is behind her eyes? That sounds familiar. I haven't seen that one. I think I saw that. Maybe it was on a Netflix commercial. I'm not sure. Um, oh, coming to America is prolific. Huh? I heard. So, I heard some mixed reviews about uh, about coming to America. But I'm going to. I'm gonna. Oh, I care a lot. I actually wanted to watch that. I actually really wanted to watch that. Cool. Um, I think, yeah, I think most of you have done it. Thank you to, to those of you have that have. I really, really appreciate it. Um, Snowpiercer, I think I've heard of that too. That sounds really familiar. Yeah. Cool. All right, I'm going to end the poll. And, oh, see, another couple too just trickled in. Thank you. All right, I'm going to end it now. Cool. Thank you, guys. Um, and oh yeah, Queen's Gambit. I gotta get on that too. I'm I'm slacking on a lot of these. <laughs> but uh Jeff, I'll let you I'll let you continue. And if folks have questions, yeah, feel free to throw it in the chat. Okay, cool. Um before I get started, I see a couple of questions in the or three questions in the QA that I haven't been really been following. Um how do we get the math background? Um yeah, that's a good question. Um I wish there was just like you could just like plug in a flash drive in your like brain or something and that would that would be it but um <laughs> yeah how do, how do you get a math background um hmm. um i i think for me i i remember using so so i was fortunate enough where i had a math background from some college so that was definitely useful but um what, what i would also recommend is are you familiar with khan academy uh, if you're familiar with Khan Academy, um, like if you just want some like if you're just want some like kind of basic stuff, kind of like what I'm going over today, like if, you, if you're curious about derivatives, if you're curious about calculus, if you're curious about uh, probability, like I would check out check out Khan Academy. Um, it will kind of get you going in the right direction. Um, and then where does R fit into this? Um, yeah, so there's two two main languages. In kind of the data science world, um, and um, yeah, they're they're uh, very very similar. Um, Pandas, this library that I'm using, is based on the R data frame, and um, um, I personally like Py- uh, Python so much better because um, it's just you can do so much more with it. There's a, a bigger user base, so like when when something new comes out in data science world, because there's a bigger user base in Python, it gets implemented in Python a little bit uh, faster. 
um, but they're, they're very, very similar languages. Um, and with Python, you can have, you can do a lot more. You can be, uh, uh, you can do like web development or and you could do other stuff as well. So what would we need to do all the data code input as well as the equations? Or as a data scientist only deal with numbers? I mean, the start of such a project where you fit. Um, so what would we need to do all code data code input? Um, yeah, I think like the start of a project is kind of just, you begin with like a problem. So you start with like, what are you trying to solve? So um, that, that kind of goes back to like the business understanding. So in, in this like problem that I'm gonna be working on in the K nearest neighbors, uh, I don't wanna jump ahead too much, but I'm gonna be trying to predict whether the car is has two doors or four doors and maybe there was some sort of like business problem around that so you start with that business problem then you start with exploring your data um you want to have a really good understanding of your data before you start kind of just throwing it into any sort of algorithm so step one always start with like a really good understanding of what your problem is Um, one more question that I might get back going. going. Um, for the last three years, I've been trying to learn software dev unsuccessfully. I wanted a better job in the building apps, but I have several failures with consistency. Um, yeah, yeah, this is a good question as well. I think, uh, I don't know if you've been kind of just doing like a self study. Um, I feel like that that's a kind of a common problem when you're uh, in like a self-study type program where you're just kind of learning on your own. And um, so the nice thing about um, being in a boot camp is that there is some accountability with it, that, um, you know, there there's timelines on when, when you have to complete stuff. There's, um, you're working with myself. There's a bunch of other data science instructors that if you have questions, you can ask questions. You're also, you have peers that are working on the same, same problem. So, they're, they're kind of going through like the, the same thing that you are that you can talk with as well. Um, and I think that's kind of the power of like, kind of like this group learning and having like kind of a community of learners. Um, so cool, let me get back into this. Um, so um, we went over like using Z score on um, this kind of fake data that I made up. Um, now going back to this car data set. So um, I'm going to be using um, length and price. So I'm going to be using K nearest neighbor here. And we see that um, length and price are on different scales. So um, I'm going to need, need to do a Z score transformation on it uh, uh, to make sure that everything's treated equally. Oh. So I'm gonna do a C-score standardization on length and price. And then uh, after I run that, you now see that everything's on the same, same scale. Um, I'm next gonna do what is called a train test split. And um, let me run this and I'll explain it. Um, Anytime you do machine learning, you want to you want to leave out a data, part of your data set. So in this case, I'm leaving out 10% of my data set. So I'm going to um, let my algorithm see 90% of the data, and then I'm going to hide that 10% and then I'm going to test it on that. So that way I can say how well my model does on data that it has never seen before. Um, so I, I made it two data sets, data we know, and then what I call what I'm calling blind data here. And then um, I'm going to um, plot it out. So what we have here is, um, um, so I have my, my red data points, I have my blue data points, and then I have these X's, and these are part of the um, data that we don't know. Um, and so these are what, what my model is going to try to predict. So like, as an example, like for this, um, let's do this point right here, this X right here. If we looked at the three nearest neighbors, would it be, would the prediction be a blue or would the prediction be red? Mm 
blue. Any other guesses? Any other thoughts? Yeah, it is a little bit hard to see. Is it better? Is it easier to see now? Um, but if we were looking at the three nearest neighbors, I would say that it's probably going to be blue because it looks like there's at least two data points here. Um, so now I'm going to apply this K nearest neighbors classifier. Um, and let's just see how our model did. And what I'm showing here is that on 21 data points, it was 71% accurate. Um, and what we can do now is take a look at our predictions. And um, um, what, we, what we have here is we have the uh, whether it predicted it, to, whether it was a, um, well, if it was X, then it was true. If it was a circle, then it, it got it false. And then what the actual value was. Um, and see, we have a question. Aren't splits traditionally 80-20 or 70-30? Um, those are pretty common ranges. I ended up doing a little bit of a smaller split. And that was because we scroll back up. Uh, my data set's kind of small. If I take a look at my data set, uh, it was only 200, 200 uh, rows. So um, I wanted to train it on a little bit more data. So by training it on, if I would have done a split of like 70%, oh, then I'm only training on 143 rows versus if I train it on 90%, then I'm training it on 184 rows. So that, that was kind of my reasoning behind that. Um, but you are correct. Um, so that was K-nearest neighbor. And I, I main idea with this is that um, um, we have we did that z-score uh, standardization and it gives us a little bit better it gives us uh, a little bit of results we should be a little bit more confident in because otherwise uh, we're going to be taking this data set and um, well, the one that's unscaled is this one and um, the, the movements in this direction are much larger than the movements are in this direction. This is on a scale of 140 to 210. This is on a scale of 5,000 to 45,000. Um, so um, making like a 10% change in this direction is uh, much larger than a 10% change in this direction. Um, cool. So... That was it for K nearest neighbors. Um, so I have another machine learning algorithm that we're going to be going over. Um, yeah, so so a negative z score just means it's it's below the mean. So like like let's say I got um, the average ACT score was a thirty and I got a twenty five. That means the z score would be negative. That means I got below the average. Um, so now, um, the last algorithm we did, we predicted something that was categorical and that, that can be really useful. So we, at my, at my last job, we would predict whether a train would be, it was an internal metric, whether a train would be a winner or a loser, like kind of based off some like internal metrics about like money. So we would use like a classifier for that. If you're predicting something that's continuous, so that you're predicting like the price of a stock or you're predicting. Um, so again, going back to the railroad, if you're predicting how much fuel we would use each month, that's continuous. We could be 100,000 gallons. It could be 990,000 gallons. It could be, um, you know, any, anywhere in between as well. Um, that's a, a continuous variable and you use a regression to solve that. So now we're gonna go through an example of regression. Um, 
So we see that I'm going to use width of the car to try and predict the price. And you see that there is a little bit of a relationship as the width increases. So as we go from here to there, the price kind of increases as well. It's not certainly not a great relationship, but uh, there is a relationship there. Um, so how do we find what line would best fit this data? Um, so we could just guess, and that's what I'm going to show first is I wrote a function to just kind of randomly guess a line. So guess line in 10, 10. So what this is, I just uh, guessed the line where the slope is 10 and the y-intercept is 10. So in a, in a line, there are two components. We have a y-intercept, so where this blue point crosses the uh, y-axis and then the slope. And slope is rise over run. Um, so we see right here, uh, this line does a bad job of fitting this data. We ideally would want this line to be like kind of um, kind of kind of fits this relationship here. And I have a metric here to kind of quantify this. Um, yeah, yeah, we are going to be using a regression on this. Um, and um, so, so I have a, a metric here, root mean squared error. And this is used to quantify how much error we have. And um, mean squared error or root mean squared error um, calculates the vertical distance between each point in the line. So like this point right here, this is that vertical distance. Um, this point right here, this is that vertical distance. So this error, because the line would be larger than this error, this is it's farther off on this point. So let's say I was going to guess another line. Like let's uh, do 100 and 1,000. So we see that this line now is a little bit more in these data points than this point, than this line. And uh, we also see that the root mean squared error, this is a lower is better metric. So the closer to zero, the better. Now the root mean squared error is 136,000 so instead of 211,000. Um, so now let's, let's do this one more time. I saw that when I increased uh, the slope and the y-intercept from 10 and 10 to 100 and 1,000, the root mean squared error um, uh, decreased. So why don't I just increase the slope and intercept again? And let's do 200 and 2,000. And we see that when it went from 136,000 to 111,000. And um, you know, I could be doing this the rest of the night and then um, still probably wouldn't, it still probably wouldn't be perfect. It's, um, it's, it's like just kind of randomly guessing like this. We see that we can kind of guess on the direction, but um, it's not very efficient. And, you know, someone just mentioned, uh, Darius mentioned regression, and that's exactly what we're going to do next is um, let's not guess anymore. Let's just uh, uh, actually find out what the actual slope and intercept is. So before we do that, I want to quickly talk a little bit about optimization. Um, and the way optimization works is you saw that I tried different values. And what these different values, they produce a different root mean squared error. And what that does is it creates this function. And um, we don't know what this function looks like, but we, what we can do is we can take the if you remember back to calculus, taking the derivative, that gets you the slope at a point. Um, so if we if we take the derivative at a point, we can take the slope at that point, and we can say, okay, which which direction should we go? Should we increase the slope, or should um, should we increase this number? Should we decrease this number? And when you take the derivative of a data point or of a function, we get the slope. And um, if we remember root mean squared error. Uh, it's a lower is better metric. So if you take the negative of this gradient, we'll go we'll go in this direction, and that'll um, minimize. So that'll tell us which direction to go to minimize this root mean squared error. Um, and I have a, another gift to kind of show this. Um, so wait for it to restart. When you first start out, this line, 
is just uh, just random guesses at the very beginning. But over time, once you start applying this and um, kind of slowly incrementing in the right direction of the slope and the intercept, we can get the line perfect. Um, so that's kind of a really high level overview of how an optimization algorithm works. And that's kind of the basis for a lot of, um, or pretty much all the algorithms that you'll, that are used in machine learning. Um, so luckily, um, it's good to know this, but luckily Python, um, doesn't force you to calculate partial derivatives by hand or using Python. So, um, we will use, um, ordinary least squares regression to do this. And um, so it, what it tells us is that the uh, slope, the I, optimal slope is 2,600 and the y-intercept is negative 16 or negative 162,000. Um, if we take a look at my guesses, I was at 202,000. So I, I was not even close. Um, and what this means, um, you know, I was kind of showing that visualization about accuracy versus interpretability. Uh, a little bit ago, um, linear regression is super, super interpretable, and it's um, that's a kind of it's like superpower. And what this means is that if we increase the width by one, we would on average expect the uh, price of the car to increase by twenty six hundred dollars. So if we run this, we see that we get a root mean square root mean squared error of 76,000. And we see that the blue line fits the data pretty well. Um, cool, I think that's all that I have. Um, what questions do we have? Will you share this Jupyter notebook? Yep. Um, yeah, that, that's a game plan, right, Jelani? Yep. I'll share the notebook with you guys so uh, you'll have access to it. And you can play around in there and um, yeah. Please guys, don't be shy. Any questions, there are no silly questions. We are here to learn. Um, so if anybody has any questions, please uh, feel free. Also know we'll send the recording out as well. Is there a relationship between data science and GANs? Um, yeah, that's a pretty advanced topic. Um, the GANs are, um, so, so a GAN, what it is, is um, it's used in deep learning. Um, and um, so, so what it is, is uh, like two neural networks and um, one, one neural network. So like if you have an image of like, a bunch of Pablo Picasso paintings. You have one neural network where its goal is to make a Pablo Picasso painting. And you have the other neural network that's sitting there and trying to predict whether it's a one that this neural network made or if it's an actual Pablo Picasso painting. So this one's trying to trick the other one. And um, there is like some cool applications of it, uh, but yeah, it's, it's a pretty advanced topic and it's, it's uh, used in deep learning, which is part of data science. Um, so I took stats in college, but no calculus is calculus a requirement for this type of learning. Yeah, you should, um, just make sure that if you're comfortable, like doing a derivative, um, like I, like I was kind of saying earlier, um, if you take a look at what I usually recommend is, um, definition of a derivative like if you're like i would go through i really like this video series they go through what the equation of a derivative is and just just kind of walk through this um, um a playlist i posted it in the chat um I missed the very beginning of this presentation. Or is this an example of stuff we've learned in the boot camp? Um, yeah, that's a good question. Um, so um, 
you should know as far as like stuff you should know before the boot camp. Um, that link that I just sent from Khan Academy, um, like make sure you're comfortable with like what a derivative is. Um, we, we're not expecting you to code it by any chance, by any, by any means. It's something we teach in the boot camp. Um, so the Z score, um, the Z score, like we're not, again, we're not expecting you to code this right away. We do teach that. No, but if you know, know what a Z score is, if you know, um, like, um, this K nearest neighbors, um, that I showed, where does that go? Um, this, uh, K nearest neighbor, um, not expected to know going into the boot camp either. Um, and the prep prep course for the, um, the prep boot camp gives you a good idea of what you, what you need for, to, to be successful in the boot camp. Yeah, I think you shouldn't be. I think you should try to prepare as much as possible, but I think one thing that I've seen some students kind of um, fall victim to is um, kind of like paralysis by analysis. Like they're like, oh, I want to learn so much before I even start. And I, you know, I always recommend like the boot camp prep is there to give you a realistic idea of like what to expect and also, um, obviously supplementary education like Khan Academy is super helpful. Uh, just so you, I think the, to Jeff's point about derivatives, like you should definitely try to learn that um, prior, but it's really to make your experience better more than anything. Like it's really to, to, to ensure that you have a smooth experience through the, through, through the boot camp, and the math part doesn't really trip you up and you're and you have an appetite for it you kind of uh, are accustomed to to learning this type of stuff so and that's why we you know host events like this is so you get sort of get um accustomed to to seeing these concepts mm -hmm. yeah definitely yeah the more the more you know going into it um obviously the easier things will be um but like like I said, like we've had students, like my 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 first student I ever worked with, um, he had worked ten years as a professional chef, and now he works as a data scientist at FanDuel, and uh, did not have a math background at all. Like it's it's very learnable. Um, you showed earlier on that neural networks are the most accurate, but not as interpretable. How would that have looked compared to what you used? Um, so. Well, like, what would that have compared to what you would use? So, like, let me pull that back up again. So, correct me if I'm like not understanding this question correctly. Um, so, I think you're asking like what algorithms I would like use when I was at the railroad or when I in my past job. Um, so, so it kind of depends on like what industry you work in and how like kind of mature like data analytics is in there in that in that field so like in a railroad it's kind of an old school industry and like you start talking about machine learning and ai and it's kind of like you start you're talking like witchcraft so um i wouldn't have been able to use like any super advanced i wouldn't be able to use a machine learning algorithm unless i could really confidently explain it to the uh Kind of the business stakeholders, the, the the vice presidents at the company. So we would kind of focus more on these algorithms at the top that are super interpretable. So we could say like, we're predicting there to be a hundred thousand us to use a hundred thousand gallons of fuel, and here's exactly the reason why. Versus like a neural network, it's it's more of like a black box where you're predicting like we're predicting there to be a hundred thousand gallons of us to use a hundred thousand gallons of fuel, but we're not necessarily as sure why and it's just the algorithm says so. So um, at, the, at, a, at the railroad, it was, it was more common to use linear regression and logistic regression. And um, in, industry wide, I think it's, it's more common to be using this out, these algorithms. There's a website called Kaggle that does machine learning competitions and they do, they do a survey every year on like just kind of how the field of data science is and, the two most commonly used algorithms are still linear regression and logistic regression, which is similar to linear regression, but it's legit. It's a uh, use for classification, like I did with the nearest neighbor.
if one were to join Flatiron, is three months really realistic to cover the programming, the math, and the higher level AI stuff like AI and neural networks? Yeah, three months would be pretty quick. Um, so, so correct me if I'm wrong on this, Delaney, but the full time program is five months long. That's where you're on average putting in about 50 hours per week. Um, we have a part time program that is uh, 10 months long and um, on average you're putting in about 25 hours per week and then we do have um, what's called self-paced where you can go as quickly as you want or as slowly as you want um, up to 15 months and I, I work as the self-paced instructor and um, I think the fastest I've ever had someone graduate is like I think it's like four and a half months um, four and a half months so three months would unless you have a really strong background already. I think that'd be pretty quick. So what's the next steps? I want to understand neural networks for academic predictions in ed tech. But for a more base lesson, can you go through the different types and maybe give a sentence or two for each? Um, yeah, that's a interesting question. Um, Network zoo. I like this diagram. Um, it's called a neural network zoo. So these are all the different types of neural networks. I'm not going to be able to cover all of them, um, but the most commonly used ones are um, so. This is kind of what kind of like what you would think of as like a base neural network, um, and. This can be used for classification. This can be used for regression. Um, and then the more advanced neural networks. Um, so this recurrent neural network, and this is called an LSTM neural network. They're used for sequence-based models. So like um, anything where like there's like a time sequence to it or where anything that's like, um, so like they're commonly used for like time series and text. So anything, when you kind of think about it, time series and text are kind of similar. Like the, if you have the word united, um, there's probably a higher probability that the next word is states or kingdom versus, um, I don't know, chicken. Um, but kind of the same way, like if the like price of a stock yesterday is going up, there's probably a higher, there's a higher probability that the stock is going to continue to go up. So these, Two neural networks are really commonly used for text and um, um, time series. Um, and then these are the really common ones that are used in image classification. So uh, convolutional neural networks are. Um, so like any like when you think about like self-driving cars or if you're trying to if you have a bunch of images of dogs and cats and trying to predict whether there's a dog or a cat in it. Um, this is what I used for that um, the Vaseline problem I was talking about earlier. Um, but if you're wanting to learn, learn about neural networks, these are what I would start with. Um, um, kind of the base neural network and then go into these um, if you're wanting to do something with text data or um, Take a look at these. If you're wanting to do something with images, do do something with these. Um, Can you uh, put that in the chat? Yeah, I am. So there's a prep boot camp, boot camp, then the program. Oh, sorry, I was on mute the whole time. Um, so yeah, sorry if the it was a little confusing. Like it is the pro, the program is the boot camp. So we are a boot camp program, um, and it's called a boot camp just because of the speed and the rigor of the program. Um, it's the way to start out is you'll do the boot camp prep, which is the it's just essentially the prep work, right? It's the work to get you from I'm not sure about how to do any of this to, okay, I, I'm, I'm, I have a good understanding of this and, I, and, I'm, and, I, and now I'm ready to take the actual step to joining the bootcamp program. So the prep work is just meant to help you prepare for the program. So once you're done the prep, um, bootcamp prep, um, 
you'll get like a very um, it's a it's a technical assessment and it won't be anything it won't be anything daunting or anything that you don't know it's really just to fit just to, to see how you think um, and once you're done that technical assessment uh, you're gonna do your and you let's you know assuming like everything goes through right your financing is right everything is fine and you end up admitted into the program now there's a another set of work that you have to complete by the time you you uh you have your start date so for instance the the next start date is april 26th right so april 26th um you know let's say you get your confirmation on april 5th that you're ready for april 26th that those first those um three weeks before you start there will be some work that you have to do before joining the joining on your first day but you will be admitted as a student and then once you start on your first day um you're all good to go and um and then yeah and then you're you, you start the program uh i think hopefully that helps um and there's one more for me that i'm gonna respond to can i comment on the support a student gets in a self-paced program versus live and this scheduled program so as a self-paced student myself, um, it's a this, as a self-paced student, and, and Jeff, you can back me up on this. Like, that's a much more independent route. Like, that's a much more um, there's not there's not as much accountability. So you have to kind of rely on your own ability to uh, create a schedule and stick to it. Personally, like. I find it tough, like, but it's all, it's also the only program that really works in my schedule. Um, the lie for the schedule program, that one is it's it's is a lot of accountability, right? So at each week you have you have particular goals that you have to hit, particular lessons that you have to do. So there's a lot of um, accountability there, and a lot of support there. I think for self-paced there's there's support but it's your it's majority of the time you're pre, you're working independently but uh jeff you can kind of speak to what it's like to be um you you know you, that's your program essentially so i'll let you talk about it yeah yeah the you know, self-paced uh, kind of like jelani was saying and there's it's a lot more flexible like if you're busy one week and it, it doesn't really matter as long as you're able to like get caught back up um so like it, you know in life for a lot of you know depending on what your like personal life and professional life outside of learning data science looks like it, it could be kind of kind of difficult to like be in a paced program so that's kind of where the self fit that's where self-paced is really good um but you do you do really need to have like some sort of like schedule or like be be really good with like setting kind of internal deadlines for yourself um something i kind of do try and do with like students is like have them um, so part of the program is you have to sign up for, to complete the program, you have to complete uh, projects. I'll have them sign up for projects even before they're ready. It's because they can kind of use that as like a motivator or a deadline to like, I, I'm going to have to present to Jeff on this day. So I, I better get, I should try to get it done. Um, but yeah, the uh, scheduled program, it is, um, it is, there is, there is an expectation that you complete this these number of lessons every single week and if you don't then you're behind and um it's just not a good situation when you're behind um like so that from joshua like in this problem you tackled tonight you used um uh, oh i skipped one um from jeff Jeff with a G. Um, this may be too much to discuss right now, but I'm trying to imagine a general solution to finding the least steep slope to bike along possible paths instead of finding the best fit. Do you have any suggestions for finding lines that avoid outliers? So like, hmm, um, this kind of reminds me of like a, so like finding the best path, like this kind of reminds me of like a situation where you would want to use like a network graph so if you have you have a point with this, my handwriting is a little rough so you have point a and you're going and there's point b uh, that's supposed to be a b uh, we have a point c 
And then maybe we're just trying to make it simple. We're just trying to go to point D. Um, and imagine like you have, so these would all be considered nodes and the line here is considered an edge. You know, like, let's say we knew like the steepness of each of these trails. So this is a three, this is a two, one, and a one. So like um, you can use like a network graph and in a lot of senses, most cases they're much more advanced than this, where I just wanted to do like a simple example where you could, um, there's algorithms to find the shortest path. There's algorithms to find the path that optimizes these edges. And that, that's probably what I would want to do is um, use, use a network graph. They're like commonly used in like, um, like social networks, if you can, you can see like who, who's an influencer, who has the most edges or who has, um, you can use it to like visualize board of directors. And um, this, this is kind of a, something that's used like with how like um, Google Maps works where they're trying to find the optimal, um, optimal, disk, optimal route based off edges, which is usually time. So like in this problem you tackled tonight, you used the linear, you used the linear regression. What would it look like using neural networks? Yeah. Um, so, so with a neural network, um, it kind of looks like a network graph in a way, but, um, so I used, um, so I used width, the width to predict the height. Um, so the way a neural network works is, you have these things called nodes again. Um, but like, let's say I had, instead of just using the width, let's say I had the width, I had the height, and I had uh, the length. Um, so you start with those three points, and then you then you start having what's, uh, these other neural, other neurons, uh, which are other nodes. And um, let's do like three more. And it does get a little bit out of control. Um, so each of there should be a line between each of these points and each of these nodes. And then I will have a final node right here, and this will be the, the price node. Um, so I don't want to dive too deep into this. Um, but what, what goes on is you, you have your three inputs. You have uh, they feed into your input layer, which feeds into a hidden layer right here. And then feeds into this price. And then what's going on here is uh, we didn't necessarily cover it, but it's a bunch of linear algebra, a bunch of dot products. And that dot products will be able to allow you to capture a whole bunch of different relationships. And uh, that's um, so in the example that I drew, there was uh, just a single one of these layers, but you can have multiple layers, you can have more of these little circles. Um, but yeah, in the program, we teach something called Keras, which um, is used with TensorFlow. And, uh, you'll you'll definitely see more, much more of that. Are SVMs widely used? Um, so yeah, so SVMs are kind of in this part right here. Um, yeah, this is a good question. Um, so random forest is considered an ensemble method um, in neural networks. If, if you look on Kaggle, um, five years ago, random forest, gradient boosting, and gradient boosting still, where random forest was the dominant algorithm on Kaggle. If you, if you were going to win a Kaggle competition, it was with a random forest. Now, if you're going to win a Kaggle competition, it's with a neural network. Um, so um, support vector machines, in my opinion, are not not nearly as used as much as random forests or neural networks. And reason being is random forests um, are relatively still interpretable. Um, they, they make it really easy to understand what's the most important feature. And um, they're relatively easy, easy to understand. Um, you can still kind of explain it to a non-technical audience. So a support vector machine is a little bit more challenging to explain. And, it, and you're not getting the same performance that you get with a neural network. So is this material covered in the data science program? And that's from Anne. Um, so you asked that after I stopped like talking about like the math and data science. So I'm guessing you were talking about maybe about the 
referencing like the, the neural networks. Um, yeah, we, we do cover neural networks in this program, um, if that was what, what you were specifically asking. If not, uh, just ask, ask again. All right, we can take a couple, these last couple ones. What happens if we fall behind? How do you assist students who fall behind in the program? Um, yeah, yeah. Um, I don't know. We, so that there is a, like an option to transfer if you to like move to another cohort or move to self-paced. Um, but but also like it's it's ideal if we can if you can stay in the same cohort. Um, so so if, if a student is falling behind, then um, we'll try to try to work with them a little bit more and um, kind of see if there's like some well what caused them to be behind. Was it? Um, something technical that we could try and help out, like help them out with that technical problem. Was it maybe something just didn't have as much time and we can kind of talk about like how to, how to get caught back up. So um, it's really, really about trying to just figure out what, what caused it and how can we assist. And there's a lot of study sessions available too with other students. So we hope that folks, when they, when they work together, the likelihood of someone falling behind is, um, is low. Um, next question is, I've worked in a variety of jobs in different industries for over 15 years, none of them requiring higher level math or statistics or programming for someone who is older and inexperienced in this area, but at least a bit experienced in life. What type of ROI can one expect from this boot camp based on previous students experiences and feedback. Um, I can tell you, I can, I can only, I can tell you some like feedback sort of anecdotally. Um, I tend to think that people that are that have more experience and have like domain knowledge in particular areas actually um, do well in this program. Uh, I, I think it's really I think it's understated how important your actual domain knowledge and your um, I guess your understanding of the business problem is. So like I have a friend of mine who was a man, he used to do like, um, like music promotion for a long time, and then ended up coming to, uh, to Flatiron School to do data science, and is now working at a music company as a data scientist. And there's no way he does, there's no way he gets that unless he has that domain knowledge. And in his, I mean, in his music, uh, in his music admin role, he's never touched anything to do with data not a single thing to do with data right like the the most data he saw was oh we have x amount of people coming in we have um we, this is the type of revenue that we saw like he wasn't he wasn't um in, he wasn't doing a lot of high level math and stats or programming in his career but made that transition with obviously you know some hard work and a lot of domain knowledge and he ended up, he's doing really well at this, at this role because he actually cares about music. So all that to say that I, that I never undervalue your experience because your experience is, if anything, a leg up and an advantage. So I think, yeah, I think folks would do, yeah, data science spans across all areas of workplace. Exactly, exactly. So um, that's kind of, even if companies aren't doing it now, they're way behind, they'll eventually have to get on board um, using data to inform their decision. So yeah, that's kind of my take on it. Um, okay, I'm just gonna answer one more. We're at eight o'clock. I am sorry, we are, we are at time, but I'm gonna get one more in. Uh, is this fully online? And if so, do you expect to continue to be? We are fully online right now. Um, we are essentially listening to the health professionals when it comes to um, when it's time for us to get back in person. Right now, I think the date is like tentatively a date in May. Um, to be perfectly honest with you, I don't think we're going to keep that date. It might get, it, it in all likelihood will get pushed back, but don't quote me on that. Um, right now, that's the date we have. Uh, so it looks like I would, I would, for all intents and purposes, prepare to be online for the foreseeable future until um, until we can make some kind of announcement and confidently say when we can do uh, live in person again. 
with that being said, thank you so much, all of you, for sticking around and uh, asking questions and being so um, so generous with your time. I, I hope you've all learned something. Um, big thank you to Jeff. Fantastic work as usual with this. Um, and there is a survey like right after this, just to just to get feedback on the actual on this actual um, workshop. We really value your opinion. Um, it allows us to continue to do the stuff that we do here um, and do more programming. Would really love to know what you guys want to see. Um, you guys was really into neural networks, so maybe the next thing needs to be about neural networks, right? So, um, would really be interested to to get your feedback as soon as this is done. You'll get um, you'll get a, a, a survey pop up, and yeah, any feedback would be greatly appreciated. I will again. I will send you guys the notebook and the recording, um, and depending on where you're logging in from, a uh, good night, and we hope to see you again. Thanks, Jeff. Yeah, thanks, thanks, everyone. Oh, have a good one.